In this series, we're talking about how to stop fighting with those that we love most and to start fighting for. Today, I want to talk to you about how to fight for your marriage, how to fight for your marriage. Speaking of marriage, I heard a funny story about a four-year-old girl named Susie who just listened to the story of Snow White for the first time. She could hardly wait to come home from school to tell her mom. With great excitement, she retold the fairy tale to her mom after relating how Prince Charming had arrived on this beautiful white horse and kissed Snow White back to life. Susie asked loudly, and do you know what happened next? Do you know what happened next? Yes, said the mom. They lived happily ever after. And Susie said with a frown, no, I think they just got married. Now, I know that that may be funny, but the truth is there's a lot of truth to that. I can't tell you how many times I've stood there and I've, you know, done weddings. And I'll say, you know, by the authority invested in me, by the state of Louisiana, with divine, you know, sanction from heaven, I now, and I'm looking in their eyes, you know, this couple, they're so excited, you know, and, and I now pronounce you, you know, husband and wife, you know, kiss the bride. And, and, and do you think for a moment that as they kiss one another, matter of fact, one time this, the kiss was just like, it was like on and on. I was just like uncomfortable. I mean, you know what I'm talking I mean, it's just like, this is enough. Jeez. We know you're committed. But anyway, so do you think for a moment that they're thinking we're just going to give it our best shot? I mean, just think about that for a moment. That, that, I mean, everything is amazing. They're so excited. The trip's been planned. The honeymoon. But if you just kind of just take a snapshot of that moment. And then you just add a couple years and you fast forward and you, and you add some life difficulties and some, maybe some children and some job changes. And of course, you add some in-laws and of course, some potential outlaws. Can I have a big amen right there? And you now have got all of these different things in there and, and, and life has a way of shifting happily ever after too. I'm just believing for the rapture to happen today. truth is, is that we're all, we've all been, we've all been there. If you're honest, you have. As a matter of fact, if I did a marriage satisfaction poll right now, the truth is there'd be several responses. Number one, probably three. One is some of you guys say, you know, pastor, we're in a great place in our marriage. I mean, we're just kind of hitting on all cylinders. Things are happening. And, you know, we went through some valleys, but we're just kind of like at a peak moment. And and we're at a great, we're in a great season of our marriage. Some of you would say mediocre, very average. It's like we're not checking out. We're in, but it's not really bliss. Some of you would say, matter of fact, I actually had somebody say this one time years ago when I was doing a series on relationships. I'll never forget. They said, we got a flyer in the mail. And we knew that you guys at Church of King were doing something on relationships and marriage. And they literally said this. The, the husband and wife were there. And the lady said, and we looked at one another. We're giving it one last shot. If God doesn't do something in our marriage, we're calling it quits. Maybe that's where you are. And we're honored that you're here, by the way. And we're going to do our best to open the word of God, to inspire, to encourage you. Because here's what I believe. I believe that God can work miracles regardless of where you are. How many of y'all believe in the God of miracles? We, we believe that. Today, I want to talk to you about how to fight for your marriage. The truth is, is that happily ever after may be a fairy tale to some of you. And part of that is, is because there's what I would call fairy tale busters. A fairy tale buster is when things come in and it, and it shifts what our expectation was. And, and these things are part of life. Let me give you four of them. Number one, what could be some things that, quote, busted the happily ever after concept that we experienced, that we said, that we were thrilled about. Number one, difficult adjustments. You get married and you figured out real quick, your wife or your husband didn't come from just like another family. They came from another planet. 
Be careful how you say amen. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it was just like, where did you come from? Just like the perspective's different, how they see life is different. And you do know that when you're dating, you do know that that's not their total self. You do realize that, right? It's, 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 it's I mean, they're, they're, they've got their best foot forward. You get married, it's like, whoa, what happened? So it's an adjustment. Maybe it's an adjustment based upon how you view money. You're a spender. You're a saver. Maybe it's based upon how your family, your family were huggers and they're really like close and you go to those parties and the Christmas things and your aunt tries to kiss, you know, matter of fact, there's an aunt that tries to kiss you on the lips and it feels weird. Why does your aunt try to kiss me on the lips? I don't like it. And you're like, all of these adjustments, it can be small adjustments, it can be big adjustments, but it's called adjustments. Matter of fact, some of you have even gone through and are experiencing, and you're in a blended family situation. And by the way, let me just say this. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. How many are grateful that God can restore, heal, and give us another chance? How many are grateful for that? <clears throat> I recognize as I speak every time, this time of the year we do some of our relationship, I realize that if somebody's been through divorce, there's a lot of just, oh gosh, hey listen, we believe God can restore, God, God sets you back up on a place of grace, and you become a trophy of God's grace, and God, if that's in your heart, God will give you another chance. But the point is, is that in these moments when somebody gets married again, it's often you bring in and you have a blended family children, it's not easy. Matter of fact, I was talking to a couple just recently, and, it, and it's, man, we love one another, but we got <clears throat> my daughter's not fully accepting him, and, and, and my son's not fully accepting her, and, and, they're my, and, and, it's, and, so, and, it, and it's tough. And you're trying to find love again, and, and, and you feel like we're both Christians, but we've got children, we've got things, we've got things, and we're trying to navigate, and it's tough. Matter of fact, I don't recommend a lot of books, except the Bible. But I do want to recommend a book for all those of you that are in what's called blended family situations. It's written by a friend of mine, Jimmy Evans. Matter of fact, if you can pull that up on the screen, it's a good book. Uh, it's called Blending Family. Blending Family. If you can go ahead and pull that up for me. Blending Families by Jimmy Evans. Yeah. And Frank <clears throat> Martin. Everybody say difficult. Say difficult. Adjustments. <clears throat> Let me give you another one. An inability to resolve conflict. This is a potential fairy tale buster. John Gottman, who's a social scientist, found the inability to resolve small, small conflicts is more destructive to marriage than sexual issues, financial strain, and communications. Why? Because these little conflicts, if you don't know how to resolve conflicts when they're small, guess what happens? They get big. That snowball starts small, but it gets bigger, and then you start collecting conflicts. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, and there's another one. Part of the skill in relationships is to resolve them when they're small. Because if you can resolve them when they're small, then they don't get big. Because if not, then there's a blow up. You ever been involved in a relationship when the reaction didn't meet, meet the crime? It's like, what was that about? I tell you what it was about. It was a whole bunch of unresolved conflicts and one day it popped. So, Pastor Steve, is conflict bad? By the way, conflict is a reality in all relationships. Well, Pastor, we've just never had conflict in our marriage. Well, then somebody is hiding. There is conflict. It's called human relationships. The problem is not conflict. The problem is our inability to resolve conflict. That we've got to resolve. Conflict, matter of fact, conflict can actually become a building ground for relationships instead of a battleground for relationships. Where you can learn how to navigate through. And it can actually draw you more intimate into your relationship. Number three. The third, what I would call fairy tale buster, is of what's called a performance-driven mindset. What do, I, what do I mean by that? The person that is consistently comparing in their marriage their strengths against their spouse's weaknesses, it is a setup for disaster. Well, you're not good at this. Well, guess what? You're not good at everything either. And when we do that, you know how we size up, we size up relationships, even beyond marriage, really, work situations, friendships. It is so unfair. 
fair to do that. We, matter of fact, there's a heads and there's a tail. There's strengths, but your strength, if you flip it on the other side, guess what? There's also weakness attached to it. In other words, nobody is the perfect package. They're the perfect package. Yeah, until you get married, then you find out they're not perfect. But guess what? Neither are you. Here's what we do. We compare our strengths against our spouse's weaknesses. It is so unfair to do that. And that's why we need one another. Because they're strong or you're weak and vice versa. If you consistently do that, you will find yourself highly critical, highly critical and derogatory of your spouse. Number four. The fourth what I would call fairy tale buster is what's called extra marital Extra marital affairs. Stay with me. Number one is an emotional affair. Pastor, what's an emotional affair? An emotional affair is when you look to a person outside of your spouse to meet emotional needs that God intended to be met by your spouse. And let me just give everybody just a little heads up here. Whenever you're sharing with the opposite sex intimate details about your marriage relationship, intimate details, can I tell you something? You're actually, do you know you and I are actually designed as human beings to want to get intimate with people that we share our deepest hearts with? Now, I know there's professional counselor situations, there's code of ethics there, but I'm going to tell you something. Be careful sharing your innermost thoughts with somebody that's not your spouse. Because you're going to bond with them inappropriately. Here's another one. A love affair. When you, what is that? When you illegitimately look outside of your marriage to have sexual needs met outside of that marriage relationship. And we all know what happens there. We hear the stories. Here's another one. A career affair. Uh-oh. What is a career affair, Pastor? It's when you're looking outside of your marriage to get emotional needs met through constant accomplishment and deals and the adrenaline of your job. By the way, that's one that I have to watch because I like working. I enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying it, but we got to make sure that our center emotionally doesn't move outside the home. And we got to be careful that we're not finding more fulfillment there than in our relationship with our spouse. Just... Think about that one today. Here's another one, a materialism affair. What is that? When you look for clothes, cars, toys, or any physical thing to take the place of your spouse. Let me give you this last one. It's what's called an activity affair. You know what an activity affair is? And by the way, the culture is so guilty of this right now. If you just keep moving and grooving and keep producing and keep moving and activity, I go from this, 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 this. The problem is be careful that you're not hiding in activities to keep you away from emotionally connecting at home. Apart from God, who should be number one in our lives, the second most important person in our lives should be our spouse. By the way, even before our children. It is not natural. And this is so important I'm about to say. You actually have to choose to put your spouse number one. It's natural for you to love your children. It's not as always natural to love your spouse. That's why you have to make it a choice. You have to make a choice. You look at your child, they look just like you. They look just like But that's why you have to, you put, everybody say God first, spouse second. By the way, the greatest way to produce security in your children is for you to esteem your spouse. Wow. Now, as we're moving through these fairy tale busters, maybe you found yourself in a marriage disaster. If so, I want to go back very briefly today, it's going to take me 20 minutes, and I'm going to lay out for you what the Bible says for God's intention. Because here's the point. If we're building according to the blueprint, it doesn't mean that we don't go through some trials and tribulations, but we have a foundation to be able to withstand the winds. Genesis chapter 2, God's intention for marriage. Genesis 2.18, here it is. And the Lord God said, it is not good... That man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called them, each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed it up, the flesh, in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones 
and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and he shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Everyone say one flesh. That's a very important point, one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. In God's created order, the man and woman were designed for complete unity. Matter of fact, the Hebrew word for man is ish, and for woman is isha. Very interesting. Marriage from God's design from the very beginning of time was always designed as a marriage between one man and one woman. That's God's picture. And they were to be partners in life. God had placed them together. God looked at Adam, and and, and he said this, it is not good for a man to be alone. So he brought him a partner. Everyone say partner. A partner, watch this, in three things. In life, in love, and in light. Partnership. And they were to share absolute oneness. Remember this. I'm going to say this over and over again. The number one strategy of the devil is to attack your oneness in marriage. He is a master, not only deceiver, but he's a master divider. He's a master discord dispenser. He wants to get in that marriage and to divide you. And by the way, he'll use anything he can to come after that oneness. Division, suggestions, thoughts, distraction. What is he after? He's after your oneness. That's what he's after. Let me give you three aspects to marriage partnership from the original understanding from God's word. Number one, God said, I've called them to be partners in life. Partners in life. A marriage should be where the husband and wife are best friends and they're teammates. They're on the same team. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. What is God talking about? I'll tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about the concept of intimacy and oneness. It's not that we lose our sense of self and our sense of personality, but we make a decision volitionally to what? To be together on the same team. Spiritually speaking, emotionally, physically, we're on the same team. We're on the same team. Think about it. Adam had God. Adam had all the animals. He had the beauty of creation. And God said, you need somebody on your team. Wow. Marriage is not a solo sport. It's it's a team sport. You know, there's solo sports and there's team sports. It's a team sport. And I mean, you know, we got to get along with our teammate. Interesting. God says, I'm going to make a helper. Everybody say helper. In the, Greek, in the Hebrew, helpmate. What does it mean? A helper means to support, gird, surround. By the way, the word helper describes man's. Here it is, guys. It actually, you needing a helper actually describes your inadequacy, not your wife's inferiority. Can I have a big amen, ladies? Right there. In other words, guys, you need help. And by the way, she needs help. We're on the same team together. It's a complementary relationship. God has made Jennifer strong where I'm weak. And God has made me strong where she's weak. Nobody has it all. Why? Because if you had it all, matter of fact, there's only one person who had it all. His name's Jesus. And, and he's the only one. He's a perfect human being, right? So God puts strengths in you that he didn't put in your spouse. And God places you together. And it's amazing. And by the way, that's human relationships. That's why we need, God has called us to walk interdependently. Not dependent, not independent, but interdependent. Where your strengths perfectly align with their weaknesses and you walk together and you're on the same team. And you guys know this, we all know this, your spouse is strong where you're weak. I can go back to the times and thinking about Jennifer. She's intuitive. She sees things. Hi, Jim. She's got so much insight in things. And, 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 and times where, where I'm like, I didn't, I didn't see that. I didn't get that. By the way, famous words, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I mean, those are very healthy words. I mean, she just knows things. Like, for example, I mean, this is very simple. I mean, she's very gifted in many areas. But for example, it's like she finds things. Like, we, how on earth? Ladies, I'm just going to ask this a universal question from... 
the male perspective. How is it that I can walk into the pantry and not see anything and say, where is that thing? And Jennifer walks right in and says, it's right there. How is that possible? Obviously, I'm being funny, but the re reality is that she's strong where I'm weak. And by the way, I'm strong where she's weak. Yeah. Everybody say, same team. Same team. Now, you're going to get this. You're going to get this. I'm going to say it over and over. You're on the same team. If we can see that, you're on the same team. And I'm going to tell you, the devil will use children, the devil will use sickness, the devil will use missed expectations, the devil will miss job changes, the devil will miss some expectation didn't happen at work, an in-law. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's always the same thing. He's after your oneness. He wants to divide the team. Because if he can divide the team, he can mess the kids up. If he can divide the team, he can, I'm telling you, he'll do everything to try to get in the team. Question, is it biblical to say the man is the leader of the home? Spiritual leader. Let me qualify some things here. I think it's biblical to say spiritual. I'm talking to the guys here for a second. I think some of the misunderstanding around, is it, is it appropriate biblically to say the man is the leader of the home? I would say spiritual leader. Doesn't mean he's better than, any, than her and all these, but spiritual. God has designed you guys. This is not an issue of rights. It's an issue of responsibility. In other words, you need to be the initiator spiritually. How many times have I talked to ladies in our church? Pastor, I wish my husband would step up. I wish you would. I would. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Because God has designed you, man, let me just say this, to be the spiritual. In other words, to grab her hand at night and say, let's pray together. I've been to college, Bible college, seminary, graduate, all the, I'm a, trust, I'm a pastor, I've been doing this long, and it's still awkward for me at times where I've got to grab her hand and, I, and let's pray. But let me tell you something. It's not about how I feel. It's what's right as a spiritual leader. Everybody say spiritual leadership. Guys, God's called us to step up and to lead spiritually. All right, that's a whole other message. Just wanted to throw that out. Everybody say partners. In life, I'm just going to get this same team, same team. You're on the same team. You're on the same team. Don't let the enemy divide the team. Stay, st same team, same team. All right, number two, partners in love. Not just life, but love. Look at Genesis 2, 22. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. Adam had God and he had all the animals. This is just amazing. Yet he still needed. They st he still needed to be on a team. God said there was someone else he needed. Notice where God took Eve out of. The rib. What? To be alongside of. To be a partner. That's right there. To partner in life. For that man to love and to, and to care and to protect and to spiritually cover and to lead and to and to and to be right there. It's a partner, it's a partner in in love. Adam's perception of God enabled him to receive Eve as a gift from God. Eve was a gift. Guys, your wife is a gift to you, a gift to be loved and cared for. A Ephesians chapter 5. By the way, the, uh, why do you think there's so much an, of an attack on marriage? Because the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife is the picture that the Bible gives us of the relationship between Christ and the church. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The world's understanding of love is based upon performance. I'll love you if. God's definition of love is I'll love you in spite. It's unconditional. How many times do we get hurt in a relationship and, and our spouse and we want to pull back emotionally and I want to just keep pulling back and I just want to keep pulling back and we've all been there. I've been there. We've all been there. But, but there's something about stepping out and, and, and staying connected and fighting for that oneness. Fight, fighting, fighting for that. Not loving based upon performance, but loving in the same way that we're loved by God. Yeah. Same team. Everybody say same team. 
I'm going to say it over and over. You're on the same team. You quit fighting with your teammates. Fight for your teammates. Same team. Same team. Your partners. You're on the same team. Don't let anything divide the team. <sighs> Number three, partners in life. Partners in life. Partners in love. And partners in life. Verse 25. The Bible says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. You know, it's pretty cool to see that picture of Adam and Eve and just walking with God in the cool of the day, and they're, they're not ashamed. This is before sin entered the world, by the way. And they were, the Bible says they were, they were naked and unashamed. They were just walking. There was a purity. There was an openness. There was a transparency. There was a vulnerability in their relationship. It's beautiful. And then all of a sudden, Genesis chapter 3, when sin entered that marriage relationship. Oh, man. Everything changed. When there was light, there was openness. There was vulnerability. There was transparency. There was intimacy spiritually, emotionally, Sexually, it was beautiful. And then all of a sudden, when sin came, darkness entered. Not light, but darkness. And when darkness entered that relationship, now there's so much mistrust. Mistrust between one another. Wow. How could this wonderful transparency now be lost? Sin. I, I cannot tell you enough how important it is for us to understand to do everything we can to keep our marriage pure and to keep sin out of it. What do I mean by sin? I'm talking about anything that you think that would defile your marriage. Just keep it out. Just keep it out. Just keep it out. Why? Because it gets in there and it pollutes and it dilutes the power of the team. Let, let me give you just one, and I want to be very sensitive but very clear in this one, and it's pornography. I, I read a statistic recently, and it was it's so alarming, just the amount of people that are hooked. It, neurologically, you have to understand what happens to your brain when you look at pornography. By the way, it's a fantasy world. And people do it to protect themselves emotionally because they think that, that, well, if I can have this experience, I don't have to make myself vulnerable. You're actually trapped in a prison. And it rewires your brain neurologically. Just like being on crack cocaine, the endorphins and the dopamine and all that stuff that's at. And so you get hooked. Now, here's the good news. And by the way, this is related to men and women, alarmingly. The pornography. And when that's entered into a marriage relationship, I've heard couples that say, we even watch things that are risque because it somehow stimulates our sexual. No, 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 no. That doesn't stimulate. That's actually dulling the intimate. That's polluting it. Now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. You can be set free, and your brain can be rewired by the renewing of your mind where your thoughts and your emotions are shifted away from being hooked on pornography and focused on your spouse. How many are grateful for the power of the gospel? How many are grateful for that? I, I want to say this to the guys, and I want to say this very respectfully. It's not true. Not everybody looks at pornography. That's not true. That's not true. I love you. I'm your pastor. Whatever location you're at, those are, it's not true. Well, I'm just a man. That's not true. You can be set free. It makes you feel dirty and you know it. And it's hurting your intimacy with your spouse. God wants purity. God wants, God, God wants power. God wants his purpose to be established in that relationship. So what do we do? Number one, it's very hard to be right with our spouse when we're not right with God. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads right now. Maybe you're watching. Maybe you came because somebody invited you to a relationship series at Church of the King. We're so honored to have you here, wherever you're watching, online, any location. When we're right with God, I'm telling you, it gives us power and the grace of God to be able to walk with people, to own when we've done things wrong, to say I'm sorry, to have the grace to walk this out, to love unconditionally. So I just want to start right there. Are you right with God? 
Maybe you've never confessed Christ as your Savior. This is the moment right now. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know Christ? Do you know that you know that your sins have been forgiven? You can be forgiven of your sin, cleansed by God. The Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I can't save you. Church of the King can't save you. I tell you, you can. His name is Jesus. I can point to him. Call upon the name of the Lord. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, across all of our locations, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I'm not sure about my relationship with God. I'm not sure if I die today, I'm ready to stand before God. If that's your the count of three, I'm going to ask you to quickly hold your hand up high and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. One, two, three. Quickly hold your hand up high so I can say, God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless you right there. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you right there. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Way up top. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. God bless you guys right there. Church, let's pray with every head bowed and every eye closed. This is the most important prayer they'll ever pray in their whole entire life. Can we pray this together? Can we pray this? Say, dear Jesus. Come on, everyone. Dear Jesus, I come to you today. The sinner in need of a Savior. Say this. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life, and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name. Everybody said. Wow, what an amazing message, and I'm just loving this series so far. It's been so good, and I'd love to just hear from you. What's God speaking to you? What are some takeaways from the message from you? Why don't you take a second right now to just type it in the chat room and let us know what God is speaking to you. But I also want to take a second to acknowledge those of you who maybe you feel like God's really doing something in your heart. Maybe you're making a decision right now to give your life to Jesus or to recommit your life to Christ. If that is you, we just want to say congratulations, because as a church, we believe that's the best decision that you could ever make and we're cheering you on we want to help you as you begin this new journey of following Jesus yes and we would love nothing more than to come alongside you and encourage you and equip you with some practical tools as you start this new journey this new life with Christ and so the easiest way for us to be able to connect with you is if you text the word decision to 822 or fill out the short form in the chat room right now so that we can follow up and connect with you this yeah, week. Yeah, and we really mean that. Well, you don't want to miss next week as we continue our series called Fight For. Week three is going to be so good. And don't forget about Serve Day. Get your Serve shirt. Get ready to lead or join a project. And let's see what God's going to do through us as a church as we go out and serve people next weekend. Well, with that being said, our time is coming to a close, but we really enjoyed being with you today. We hope you have an amazing rest of your week, and we'll see you next weekend, same time. Same place. We love you guys. See you next week. <laughs>